Good evening, everyone. We're going to get started. Thank you for your patience as we worked out um, some of our simultaneous translation services. Um, welcome, everyone. We're very glad to see all of you tonight. This is our third meeting today. This is number three of 15 um, public workshops that DPR uh, will be holding throughout the state. Next week, we'll be going down to the Central Coast and, and the Central Valley, and then over to Imperial Valley. Um, so thank you for being here. We know you have a lot going on, and we appreciate the time. Um, my name is Tanya Carlone. I am the facilitator. I work for the Center for Collaborative Policy, which is based out of Sacramento State University. We are neutral facilitators, and our, our objective is to help um, stakeholders and the public agencies to build their capacity um, using collaborative strategies to improve public policy outcomes. I'm here with my colleague, Stephanie Horry, who will be taking notes, just so you understand that um, these proceedings will be documented, and we will be creating meeting summaries that will be available to you following our, um, the, the completion of all of these workshops, which will be in mid-June. We are also webcasting. We webcast at our last meeting, and this, this meeting is also being webcast. And it gives an opportunity for those who, would, who are not able to attend in person to, to be able to participate. This will be the last webcast um, um, meeting. And then we will also have that available for people to, to watch after. So given the webcast, uh, when we take public, when we take your comments, we will stop and, and see uh, if anyone has emailed in some, some comments as well. Um, I would like for us to go ahead and take a look at the agenda. So if you could look at your agendas. We'll just give an overview so you know what we're doing today. And for those of you who've been to the two previous meetings, I, I uh, thank you for your patience. So you're getting quite a bit of repetition here today. Um, so the purpose of our, our meeting, as the agenda says, is to receive input from affected parties on concepts that DPR intends to use in the development of new regulations for potential restrictions on pesticide use near schools. And we are doing that in each of these locations that I told you about with school administrators, with the agricultural community, and with the, the general public. Um, looking at the agenda after my remarks, um, Chris Reardon, the Chief Deputy Director for DPR, will be making some opening remarks and further explaining the timeline and process for the development of these new regulations. And then George Farnsworth, the Enforcement um, Branch Chief for DPR, will be, will be providing some context and background, speaking about the current requirements that, that exist, um, current regulations that exist for, pe per, for pesticides and pesticide application. And then we'll be moving into some discussion of regulation concepts. And you um, should have some materials in front of you. You have a copy of the PowerPoint presentation. And you also have a paper that is a concepts paper that, that um, reflects uh, many of these, reg these regulation concepts that, that George will present about. And then following that, and this is where we want to spend most of our time tonight, we will be taking public, uh, we will be taking comments and input, because that's what we're here for. This is an, an informal process before a rulemaking process, and we would like to receive as much of your input as possible, realizing that that will influence and have a bearing on the development of these regulations. Um, so that will be uh, most of our, our meeting today. We'll focus on that. And then Chris will close it out for us. And I just want to note, note that you'll see at the bottom that asterisk, and I've alluded to this already, that these, um, these workshops are in addition and, and prior to required public meetings that will occur um, in the development of the regulations. Um, a couple of housekeeping things, just because the building requires us to say this, that in the very unlikely event that we need to evacuate, do not use the elevators. You'll go down the stairs, and we evacuate across the street to Cesar Chavez Plaza. And you'll note that the bathrooms are 
to the left and, and down a hallway there. Just follow the signs. And please silence your cell phones. Um, and I think I'll just turn it over to Chris. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. I appreciate it very much. Well, let me welcome you here this evening. I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules to be here. Um, let me, I just wanted to give you a general outline of what, uh, what will occur this evening and, and hope that um, um, your participation fits into these guidelines. But, uh, but um, I think our, our general plan this evening is to have George Farnsworth sitting next to me walk through uh, some of our current requirements. They're going to they're be very specific. Um, talk a little bit about DPR's role, what, what the existing roles are um, in terms of our regulatory requirements. And then what we'd like to do is get into regulation concepts and talk um, in greater detail. And I, we have some questions um, that we've thought about. I think uh, our hope is that you've had some questions that you've thought about. And, um, and then um, we'd like to sort of general participation. I think we're going to open up to general participation to get your thoughts and ideas about how we put together this um, statewide regulatory system uh, that's going to add additional measures around schools. Just as, just as a note, as you look on the screen here, um, this sort of signifies some of the challenges we have in California. It would surprise you that we have schools all over the state, and you know, particularly in rural areas that uh, are directly adjacent right next to agriculture. Next slide. Uh, so I um, also wanted to note, and I'll talk about this at the end of the meeting as well, but um, we're starting our first workshop. Uh, this, today's our first workshop. We expect to end the workshops, I believe, on July 9th. Or June, I'm sorry, uh, June 9th. And then we have, if you'll note on here, July 31st, we'll uh, continue to get comments. So this is an unofficial process, and so we are... Uh, trying to get as much information as we can, um, and this is a fact-finding uh, meeting as well, before we go into our official process noted here in December when we go out for official notice uh, on this regulation. Uh, we expect to get this done by the end of this year. It will be noticed. Note on here February 16th. Um, we also anticipate getting probably a public hearing request once we go out for our official notice. Uh, and then... Uh, uh, we will work through our regulatory processes and we normally do and expect to be finished by the end of uh, 2016. Now as I say that, um, a regulation like this normally, this is going to be a complex regulation. I'm sure there's going to be uh, a bunch of comments. So this normally takes anywhere from nine months to a year. So I, I, I tell folks that because some folks that don't know our regulatory process go, how long does it take and why does it take so long? So, But in terms of process, that's kind of what we're looking at. We put April in there just to be safe, but our goal is going to be try to get this done out by the end of this year in terms of noticing it and wrapping this up by the end of uh, 2016. So. With that, George, uh, I think is going to begin a discussion on our current requirements. <clears throat> Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> um, I'm going to go through a couple of slides. The first, will, first two will be some background information, and then I'm going to go through two or three more slides that just give examples of how we regulate pesticides here in California. <clears throat> to be sold for use in California, all pesticides must first be registered by US EPA and then by DPR. <clears throat> but before a product can be registered, manufacturers must demonstrate products can be safely used and that workers, consumers, and their children and others will not be adversely affected. Our mandate here at DPR is to ensure that pesticides are used safely. We evaluate each under the guidelines of the Food and Ag Code to ensure no harm will occur to human health or the environment when pesticides are used according to label directions. For each product, we review product composition and chemistry data, acute and chronic toxicity data, environmental fate, effectiveness against target pests, hazards to non-target organisms, and most importantly, worker exposure data. That's not the end of what we do as far as registering products. We have an ongoing, continuous evaluation of products. We, those of you familiar with DPR know that we have an environmental monitoring branch, and we also have a worker health and safety branch who continuously conduct studies throughout California to ensure that pesticides are behaving as expected. <clears throat> We 
We regulate pesticides through enforcement of laws, regulations, and something you may not be familiar with called permit conditions. Every pesticide must have a label and is it a violation of state law if the product is used in conflict with that label? You'll often hear people that work at DPR use the, the phrase, the label is the law. DPR can also adopt regulations to help fine tune laws and labeling depending on need. Some regulations that we've adopted are general and are applied statewide. An example of that would be our personal protective equipment requirements that we have set forth for workers that are handling pesticides. Um, we've had regulations on the books for many years um, that help to protect workers that work in fields and handle pesticides. Another example of a much more specific regulation um, that that really um, can apply to, we often adopt specific regulations that apply to specific crops, timing, and geographic areas. An example of that would be our rice herbicide regulations. But because agriculture in California is extremely diverse, we have 58 counties, all different. Um, fortunately, we have a third option. Um, for products that are designated as California restricted materials, we have the ability through the county agricultural commissioner's offices to impose additional requirements. No, no one can purchase and use a California restricted material unless they are certified, have ample training, and, and follow the directions of the commissioner. No one can, <clears throat> the commissioner will not allow a person to purchase the, the restricted materials unless they have received a restricted materials permit issued by that commissioner. The reason for this structure is that the commissioner can then impose local requirements on the use of those particular materials. Um, this has been very effective over many years um, in helping regulate pesticides in California. So I'd like to go through just a few examples and Randy's going to go through one um, as well. Um, starting with a legislative example, um, in January of 2001, the California legislature enacted the Healthy Schools Act of 2000. <clears throat> this law puts requirements in place for pesticides used at schools, on school grounds. Under this law, each school must give a written notice to parents and staff identifying pesticides expected to be used during the upcoming year. The law also provides that parents and staff can register with the district if they want to receive notification of individual pesticide applications at the schools. The school is re required to notify those persons at least 72 hours prior to application. This law also requires posting prior to applications of pesticides at schools. Posting must be made 24 hours before an application and remain posted for 72 hours afterwards. The signs that must be posted must bear information about the product, who made the product, the product's registration number, the schedule and date of the application, and the reason for the application, meaning the tar what is the target pest. In addition, all applications made on schools, are, reports of use must be submitted to DPR. Um, there was recent amendments made to this statute that requires um, both the, the pri privately hired applicators and now school employees to report pesticide use um, to DPR. Randy's gonna cover the next slide, Randy Sagawa. Yes, another example of restrictions around schools is uh, the requirements for fumigant pesticides. Uh, fumigant pesticides are gases and they're often applied at higher rates than most other pesticides and so that creates the potential for uh, exposure to people. And so both US EPA as well as DPR and, and agricultural commissioners have additional restrictions for these, type, for these types of applications. For most fumigations, uh, there's a buffer zone 
surrounding the fumigated area. That buffer zone can vary in distance be, depending on the fumigation method, the number of acres being treated, and the application rate. And so there's a buffer zone between the fumigated area and residences and businesses. In the case of schools and other difficult to evacuate sites, there's an additional protection. There's an additional distance that is required uh, depending on the size of the buffer zone. If the buffer zone is 300 feet or less, then there has to be at least one eighth mile to that school um, or 660 feet. If that buffer zone around the fumigated area is more than 300 feet, then there has to be at least a quarter mile or 1320 feet to that school or difficulty evacuate site. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, we're, we're fortunate in California to have yet an additional tool to help us regulate pesticides um, at the local level. Um, this is an example of um, what can happen at the local level. Um, in San Bernardino, they um, opted to adopt a local ordinance that imposes um, some restrictions and prohibitions for applications of pesticides. Um, what's more common in California is that county agricultural commissioners use what I described earlier as our restricted materials um, permitting program. Um, if you look in your packet, you will find in one of the appendices a summary of 15 counties um, permit conditions or, or agreements and arrangements and communications that they have in place at the local level that specifically address applications of pesticides near schools. So um, that's pretty much what I wanted to share with you that as far as background, um, as you can see, we have laws, we have regulations, and we have local restrictions available to us. Um, there are many things at play here. There are a lot of tools that um, have been effective um, and continue to be effective. There are some that need some tweaks. Um, so again, um, I'm restating what Tanya and Chris have said. We're here to get input. We want to hear what you have to say. Um, we want to work together to put together a statewide proposal. Tanya? Thank you. So I would just invite you up to the podium if you have questions directly related to um, George's presentation. So questions for clarification. And then later, in a moment, we will get to actual more input and dialogue. So if there are any questions for clarification, I'd invite you to come up to the podium. Okay, thank you. George will continue to talk about the regulation concepts, and then we'll get to your, your comments. Thank, thank you, you, Tanya. Again, um, as you came in, you received a packet of information, the concept paper. Um, we developed that paper um, trying to keep it somewhat brief, but yet provide pertinent information and, and resources for folks to understand this issue. Um, and there's some information there that um, may help you think more um, about more ways that we can develop a statewide rule. Um, so I encourage you to look at that. Um, I want to draw your, your attention to um, the appendices of that, that document, but first I, I want to point out um, a, a longstanding policy with the department and the county ag commissioners. Whenever we receive a complaint that in one way, shape, or form indicates or implies that a pesticide is involved, we have a policy of a 100% follow-up. Um, we're, we're proud of that policy, and we will continue to abide by that. Um, that said, one of the documents or the appendices to the document that you received is a survey. Uh, it's an informal survey that we conducted of county ag commissioners that focuses on pesticide complaints that had an association with schools. Um, another document that is, uh, or appendix that is in the document um, is the summary that I mentioned earlier of 15 counties' um, local permit conditions. And the third appendix is a summary of what's going on in other states in the country um, with regard to um, applications near schools. Um, 
in looking at this information, um, we made um, a determination that there are two distinct areas of concern that we really should address through, through regulation, um, and that's why we're here. Those two areas are increased communication about pesticide applications near schools, and reducing the potential exposure of children to pesticides by imposing additional restrictions on applications near schools. Um, we've identified basically three interest groups, and we are meeting with all three, um, school administrators, growers and applicators, and community parents, teachers, and, and other public parties. <clears throat> we want your input, um, and we really look forward to working with you. As Chris stated, unfortunately, this is not a short process, but um, we believe that we can be um, proactive and, and successful in coming up with something that all parties can live with statewide. So with that. Yes, so with that, we, that we would like to get your, your input. I'm going to ask Chris and George to come down and sit in the, in, uh, the front row here so that um, we can turn the podium around and, and the, the comments can be presented to the entire room. And um, thank you for doing that, gentlemen. And um, I will be taking some notes on the flip charts and, and Stephanie will be taking notes there to make sure that we, we document everything that is said here. Um, to let you know, again, I'd like to reiterate that this is an, we've said this a couple of times, I think it's worth repeating that this is an informal process that is prior to an, the rulemaking or official development of the, the regulation. So we're here to listen. The department is here to listen. We're here to listen to one another and to learn. So we would like to really bring that tone to our, our discussions. I would also encourage you to listen to others' comments very clearly and try not to be redundant or repetitive so that um, we're, we're able to capture everybody who wishes to speak, all of your comments in the room. And remember that, please, if you have something to offer, come forward because that is going to shape and influence the development of this, of this regulation. All right, are there any questions about, oh, and let me say one thing because it came up in the last meeting, just a process note that um, if we could change the slide, we, um, we have a series of questions around these sort of two prongs of concepts that George um, presented around notification and then the possible additional restrictions. And so DPR has developed questions that they want to make sure that we cover, but, but, but we're here to listen to any other questions and comments that you might have. So we'll move through those, and then we'll also open it up for general comments. Um, and I'll make sure that I'm watching the time so that we have uh, an, a, enough time to have those general comments represented. Um, realize that my role as a neutral facilitator is to make sure that everybody in the room has an ability to speak if you wish to. And therefore, please keep your comments as concise as possible and realize that I may ask you to wrap up. And I, and I, and I thank you in advance for your cooperation on that point. Okay, so with that, we'll start with the, the, the more sort of formal questions here and then open it up. Um, the first is really around input on notification. As you can see there, um, the question is, would you like your school to receive notification of pesticide applications near, that are occurring near the school? And then maybe if you want to go into a little bit of detail about what information you would like for the schools to receive and what you would like the school to do with that information. So are there any comments specific to this question and related questions? And if so, I invite you to please come up to the podium. What is a school? Oh, OK. A Could you come to, uh, just because we want to, we're on a webcast. Sure. Thank you very much, Richard. So my question is, what is a school? What defines a school? Is it a preschool? Is it a homeschool? Does it have to be state school or city school? What defines a school? Thank you. 
And um, I want to uh, make sure that uh, George and Chris, if you'd like to respond, that you have a microphone available to you. Is there, okay, and you want to press the thing on the bottom. Yeah, these are right there. Uh, yeah, thank you. We're, our, our initial thought now is we were looking, we we're talking about public schools, but we know that there's, we, we've gotten some additional questions about uh, charter schools and other schools as well. So for us, that's sort of an open question. When we say schools, our initial thought was public schools, uh, all public schools. But um, uh, we realize, too, that there's many more charter schools out there than there used to be, and there's some other schools uh, as well. So um, it's, it's an issue that we're aware of, and uh, we appreciate your thoughts, because we, uh, uh, we knew we were going to have to d work on this issue, and that was one of the reasons why we proposed this, is to sort of get thoughts and feedback on the whole issue of what a school is. Because at least our thought right now, under our regulation, now it's public schools. Um, but uh, we think uh, your question's important. So um, we understand we're going to have to, to work on that, to work our work through that issue. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Efrain Camacho. I'm a community worker with CRLA. I just want to identify myself first before I make the comments on that. My, my suggestions there were that the parents and teachers be notified in writing or by automated phone call, you know, to whoever, I guess, whoever is the affected party, in this case, the students and the teachers. And that um, whatever pesticides are going to be applied, I think something has already been mentioned, but as far as the labels, uh, provide the names and labels of the pesticides to the school administrators and to the staff and the students. But more important is uh, we don't expect this to happen, but uh, if somebody was to become ill, uh, to, to be able to have the information for the uh, treating physicians. I would be treating uh, uh, whoever was uh, affected by the spray. I'm sorry. Yes. I didn't quite capture it. Yes. Uh, first of all, that the, the names and the labels of the pesticides uh, be provided to the school administrators. Mm -hmm. And then uh, second, that the staff or students also um, have that information. And then uh, if it was to happen that somebody got ill, that the treating physicians would have access to the labels or whatever uh, is available uh, there to be able to treat. I want to make sure that this is on. Yes. Yes. So. Okay. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Marta González y vengo también aquí junto con el grupo de la Asistencia Legal de California Rural. Um, yo tengo un punto muy importante. Uh, tengo un hijo en la high school. Yo vengo de Winton y estoy rodeada de campo, donde quiera, por detrás, enfrente, a los lados. Uh, me, me he dado cuenta que él seguido me dice que tiene flu. Y pues se le da medicina para el flu, pero no le sirve. Entonces le compro para la alergia y le ayuda. Y me doy cuenta que cuando va usted a la farmacia en tiempo que empieza la calor o que empieza el frío, el lugar donde hay medicina para la alergia no hay nada. ¿Por qué? Porque aparte del químico que estamos recibiendo del ambiente, estamos dándole más químico a nuestro cuerpo para controlar nuestra alergia. Ay, yo viví, yo tengo como 30 años en el valle, nunca había tenido alergias de ningún tipo porque yo vivía en la ciudad, pero ahora que me moví al pueblo vivo frente de un campo de almendra, al lado de camote y así, y ahora yo padezco mucho de alergia en mis ojos, alergia en mi garganta, y me he dado cuenta de todo eso. Y a... Uh, También he pensado también en que por qué no se fumiga el viernes en la noche para que el sábado y el domingo esté trabajando el químico y el lunes ya esté libre para que los niños asistan a la escuela. 
también que haya más este, información a las escuelas para que las escuelas nos den más información a nosotros. Es todo lo que quería decirles, muchas gracias. Good afternoon, I'm here with, together with um, the California Rural Assistance Group and uh, I have something very important to share. I have a son who's in high school. Well, first, I'm surrounded by fields. No matter which way you look, uh, we are surrounded by fields. And I've realized that, you know, he kept telling me that he has the flu all the time. And so I'd get a medication for the flu, but it didn't do any good. So I'd start buying him allergy medication, and it sort of helps. But uh, when... It gets really hot or really cold. The places that sell allergy medication don't have anything. And it doesn't work anyway because in addition to all the chemicals that we already have from the environment, then we're having to take more chemicals just to control the allergies. I've been living in the valley now for 30 years, and I had never had any allergies of any type prior to that when I used to live in the city. But now that I live next to a, an almond field and next to a yam uh, uh, operation, now I have eye allergies, throat, throat allergies. And so I've realized that this is what's affecting me. And another idea that I had in that regard is that perhaps this should fumigate on Friday nights. That way the chemicals could work during the weekend, and then that clear up before Monday when the kids go back to school. And also to provide schools more information so that they in turn can provide us with more information. That was basically it. Thank you. Buenas tardes para todos. Para mí el respeto para todos los compañeros que están aquí acompañándonos con personal también que nos están ayudando a, a este problema que tenemos muy grande, ¿verdad? Es un problema de que este, tenemos que poner mucho tiempo, mucho cuidado y así también que nos escuchen, que venimos a abogar por los niños escolares, que los niños son víctimas de, de este químico pesticida. Uh, los niños están siendo envenenados, ahora ya están varios niños de las escuelas de donde yo vengo, de Madera, California, Muchos niños en, de todas las escuelas están con asma. Uh, yo tengo un nietecito que tiene apenas tres años. Ese niño cada tres meses está en el hospital con asma. Yo tengo asma también porque yo trabajé diez años en el campo. Agarré asma, me cuesta hablar, me cuesta dormir por la respiración. Y es un problema muy grande. Por eso estamos aquí para que nos escuchen que nos pongan más atención, ¿verdad?, porque los niños son el futuro de, de mañana. Uh, también tenemos otro problema con unas niñas que estaban en la escuela de madera Monroy. Eran dos gemelas, una de ellas murió de, de, de cáncer en la cabeza, porque desde pequeñita la pusieron a esa escuela, le dolía mucho la cabeza, ella pasaba con vómito, no quería ni comer y pues los papás no sabían qué es lo que tenía hasta que lo, la, la niña la llevaron a un doctor especialista y le dijeron que la niña tenía cáncer en la cabeza. Total, que hicieron todo, uh, yo les, la, los, uh, digamos, los guié para la asociación de cáncer para que les ayudaran allá, sí les ayudaron mucho pero siempre no pudieron salvar a la niña, se murió. Ahora los padres están tristes porque perdieron una niña, que eran únicas dos niñas que tenían y están muy dolorosos ellos. Por eso es que venimos aquí a, a pedirte, por favor, que nos escuchen y que hagan más, pongan más atención a las escuelas, que pongan como una fuerza, ¿verdad?, para que así todos los que como el comisionado de madera, que ponga él, uh, que nos ayude también a poner más regulación en los químicos que fumigan en las escuelas, porque los niños, pues no saben, tan chiquititos, juegan a hierba, se la echan a la boca, la mano sucia y todo. Por eso. Tenemos muchos niños enfermos. Hi, good afternoon. Um, 
Thank you uh, all for um, allowing us to speak here today. Today, And we also want to thank all the staff for uh, this space. We have a very serious issue in our community. We have to spend a lot of time in, in caring for our families um, because of uh, these situations that we are here to advocate for our children. Our children have fallen victim to these chemicals, this, these pesticides. Our children are being poisoned um, in our community. Several uh, kids from the school where I come from, from Madera, California, many of these children from all of these schools suffer from asthma. Um, I also have a grandson who is barely three years old and every three months he's admitted to the hospital because of asthma problems. I also suffer from asthma because I worked in the fields for 10 years and I contracted asthma and I have a hard time speaking as you can see and I can't sleep at night because I can't breathe. So we have a very serious problem and that is why we're here to ask to be heard that more attention is paid to us because our children are after all our future. And uh, we've had other serious issues, such as a set of uh, twin girls uh, that attended a school in Madeira, and one of them ended up dying from uh, cancer um, in her head. And since she was little, uh, she was attending that same school, and she complained about headaches, and she presented with vomit, and she didn't even want to eat. And for a long time, her parents didn't know what she had. Um, and she was finally taken to a specialist, and they were told that she had cancer. Um, at the end of the day, the specialist did everything they could. I referred them to the Cancer Association, and you know they tried to help them, and they did everything they could. But at the end of the day, they weren't able to save the girl, and she passed away. And now they're sad because they lost one of their twin girls. And these are the only two girls they had. And so this was very painful for them. And that is why we came all the way here to ask that you please listen and to pay more attention to the schools in our communities and for everyone to work together, including our local um, agricultural commissioner in Madeira, uh, to add uh, to help add restrictions to the pesticides that are allowed in school. Our children don't know any better. They go out there and they play in the fields, they play with the dirt, they take their dirty hands to their mouths, and this makes a lot of the children sick. Thank you. Tengo representando de la oficina de freno ha sido ley y también de la organización de líderes campesinas. Tenemos comité en madera. Gracias. And I'm here representing the CR, CRLA. CRLA and in Fresno and uh, Women Field Workers Association in Madera. Buenas tardes a todos compañeros y compañeras que trabaja en este programa Hoy en esta tarde nos reunimos para saber en este programa es que como de los niños de las escuelas de primaria, de, de secundaria, de otros se de cualquier otras escuelas preparatorias de todas esas escuelitas preescolar de todos es que hay unas escuelas están cerquita de fin de uva, fin de almendra files pistacho de otras clases de files de, de olivos de todos otros frutas entonces qué bueno que están piensa los señores y también a nosotros también estamos reunimos en esta tarde para saber y para comunicar a los padres de los niños de las escuelas de las escuelas de alrededor de aquí California porque o sea esos padres de los niños a lo mejor no sabía de qué enfermedad nos agarra a sus hijos y a su hija y hasta ellos también porque ahorita estará bien estamos para planear 
en este, en este programa y esta situación y este sobre despetexidas, porque hay unos químicos que están fuertes, hay unos que no, no huele olor, pero olor que tienen, lo que cae en el suelo. Cuando hace calor, se levanta olor y la misma en ese olor se infecta a los niños y las niñas y hasta uno de nosotros. Y como yo hoy estoy ahorita presente a ustedes, trabajo en el campo, ya tengo como unos 20 años, estoy trabajando en el campo, pero hay unos pesticidas, se arden los ojos, se tapa la nariz, se agarra las gargantas, hay un olor, hasta se da vómitos a unos. Pero ahora, qué bueno que están, estamos reuniéndonos aquí. Y ahora para que sepan ustedes. Y así nos vamos a dar unos consejos o hablar con el maestro, director, o sea, de los, también de los rancheros. Si ellos querían jomigar sus files, sus frutos, de lo que sea, hay unos... Primero, los, cuando nace, va a crecer flor, hay unos químicos de eso. Ya de ahí viene el fruto, ya de ahí ya va creciendo para que no caigan los frutos. Cada químico se comigan ellos. Y por eso está bien que estamos planeando de estos programas para saber. Y así nos vamos a dar una idea a sus padres de los niños y hasta los directores y hasta los jefes del digerente de administrativo, el que trabaja en el, de la escuela. Sí, es que como yo hablo triquis alta, yo vengo de Madera, California, y mi nombre es Seferino Fernández González. Gracias a ustedes. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, who are working on this new program. Today, this afternoon, we have come together um, to find out more about uh, what we can do because all of our children, whether they are in kindergarten, in elementary school, in junior or high school, in high school, all the schools um, in our communities, we have some that are right across from different fields, from grapes, from almond fields, pistachio fields, and all kinds of different agricultural fields. Um, olives, everything, other fruits. And I am glad then that you are considering um, new restrictions and notifications and that you have included us in this meeting this afternoon so that we can be better informed and so that our, the parents of school children can be better informed um, around these agricultural fields in California. Because the parents of these children many times are unaware of what's going on around them and why their children are becoming ill and even themselves are becoming ill. Because currently uh, they might feel, you know, okay, but, you know, they get sick later and they don't know why. So we are still in time to schedule changes and restrictions and, you know, create better awareness because these are very strong chemicals that they use as pesticides. And some of them you can smell right away, but others you cannot when they're applied. But then when it gets warmer during the day, the vapors... Um, are inhaled by our boys and our girls and ourselves. And then you can feel the effects. I myself have been working in the fields for about 20 years that I have worked the agricultural fields. And let me tell you, certain pesticides make your eyes burn and they clog your nose and they close your throat. Uh, it is, there are smells that can make you throw up, they're so strong. And so I am glad that you have decided to have uh, this series of meetings. Um, we need to better inform each other so that we can um, 
provide advice to the teachers, to the students, to the ranch um, managers so that they know that if they want to fumigate their fields, their fruits, whatever it is they're growing, um, to keep us uh, in consideration. Uh, it's not just one chemical that they apply, by the way. It starts from when the plant is first born, and they have a series of chemicals for that. And then when it flowers, it's a series of chemi chemicals to protect it. And as it grows and as it gives fruit, there are different chemicals that they continue to apply. So we need to give parents a better idea of how this all happens and directors and uh, the school administrators, um, anyone who works at a school. Um, I am from Madera, California, and my uh, native language is Triqui Alto, so I apologize for any miscommunications. My name is Eterino Gonzalez. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Other comments, please come forward, and I'll keep a cue, and then you please go next. Um, my name's Richard, and I would like on the topic of what should be provided, um, I believe a material safety data sheet, which says uh, the chemicals, what to do in case of the, if there's a hazard, also what time of day it's being sprayed, and I also think the information should be available to those people who have different languages other than English, so in, in a, so that everybody understands what's going on. Thank you. Yes, please, Efren. Hi, Efren Camacho again, a community worker with CRLA in Fresno. Um, <clears throat> you know, something else that, that I wanted to touch on too is that as far as um, any ag complaints, that uh, are to be made to the local uh, ag commissioner's office is that first of all that they have an 800 number because it's, it's going to be very difficult for people to make calls uh especially you know if, it, if it's a long distance call whatever it is but yeah so that's the first suggestion is an 800 number uh to anyone that's been exposed to any pesticide near any schools uh, but more important is that uh the local ag commissioner's office have spanish-speaking staff to take the complaints and then uh, the third thing is that any complaints that are being taken by the Ed commissioner's office should be handled uh, confidentially uh, to protect uh, anyone making complaints because uh, the students uh, parents may be working for the grower or the applicator that is applying uh, the pesticide near the schools so we want to make sure that that, that that information is kept uh, confidential. Other comments? Please come forward. My name is Diana Ruday, and I just wanted to uh, express my concern about the pesticides that are used around schools. Um, I understand that um, uh, three chemicals uh, are now being applied in areas including near schools by the CFDA as part of a, something called the pest um, um, pesticide um, imp environmental impact report and uh, they're being used to fight the Japanese beetle right now and I know uh, personally that there are some schools very nearby that are being affected by that. And uh, one of the uh, pesticides that is being used is, I can't say it very well, I think it's imidoclopid. It's a class of neonicotinoids that is uh, hazardous to bees. And we're very concerned about that because our bee population is dying out. Um, and I'm, also I understand that glyphosate is used quite prevalently on uh, or, or near school grounds. And on uh, March 15th, the World Health Organization, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, found that glyphosate is a, a categorized as a 2A type um, pesticide, which means it's a probable carcinogen to humans. And yet that is being used on our schools and near our schools. 
how can we get a ban on that chemical? Thank you. Thank you. Please come up. Yes, we, ha we haven't. Do we have an email? OK, let's go ahead and take that after Jessica speaks. Um, just to add to what Richard Cooney said um, and what to notify, I think that the amount of pesticide being applied is really important because we have between here in Sacramento, Jesuit and Rio Americano, there's like four square blocks. There's so much that there's a huge cloud. I can't imagine the people that have to go home to those homes that the California Department of Food and Ag decided to spray 10 times this year and next. And they've done it year after year after year and declared it eradicated with no integrated pest management plan. So the amount, the area to be sprayed, I think is crucial because that tells you how much drift you're going to be getting, how much there is in the area. And uh, the other thing is we have an inversion layer here in the Sacramento Valley. And I think there should be some attention given to the fact that in, in certain weather that can be trapped, the pesticide can be trapped, and it doesn't ventilate out. And I don't know how much attention is given to that in the application, but certainly would think about it, uh, wanting to get it ventilated out. This is an email from Jordan Steinberg. I want to first thank the Department of Pesticide Regulation for holding these much needed listening sessions, which hopefully lead to implementing real regulations that truly address the alarming pesticide use at our schools, the issues at our schools. I'm a parent of two children who attend Apple Blossom Elementary School in Sebastopol, California in Sonoma County. Apple Blossom Elementary School is a school of over 400 students, which has recently witnessed over the past two years a vineyard conversion on the surrounding 47-acre property. The school is now surrounded by 47 acres of vineyards that we are told will require the application of Roundup as well as sulfur and other pesticides. All of these applications are to be completed by the vendor who has our children's best interest at mind. The vendor who owns the property surrounding our school just agreed to pay $100,000 to settle a civil lawsuit brought by Sonoma County prosecutors last year that alleged environmental and land use violations in three vineyard conversion projects. The venter who owns the property surrounding our school ignored the memorandum of understanding his own company signed with the school stating that they would notify the school ahead of any spraying. The 47 acres surrounding our school were sprayed five times in February with Roundup with no prior notification to the school. The venter who owns the property surrounding our school chose to maximize his profits and plant every available inch of the property instead of voluntarily implementing a fairly small buffer zone to physically separate the vineyard from the school. We need new tougher regulations. Agricultural adjacent to schools must take on the responsibility for the children they are affecting. I believe the following regulations should be implemented at any site with agriculture next to school. Number one, mandatory reporting to school and agricultural commissioner of any spraying 48 hours prior to spraying. The school should be alerted so that they can monitor the situation and inform any concerned parents. The ag commissioner should be notified so that they can conduct inspections if they deem it necessary. Both entities should be informed separately so that one is not reliant on the other for their information. The responsibility for reporting falls squarely on the agricultural producer. Number two, monitoring of school zones. Agricultural producers should be required to pay to monitor their pesticide applications. Monitoring stations should be located on the school sites. If the ag producers wish to spray dangerous chemicals adjacent to schools, it should be their responsibility to, to prove that there is no contamination. They should be required to pay for ongoing third-party testing. Number three, a buffer zone should be required between agricultural crops and schools. 
physical separation as well as a hedgerow of plant material will cut down on pesticide drift. Number four, violations. It's imperative that any new regulations will be taken seriously by the agricultural producers. The San Bernardino Ordinance sets up a $100 fine for a first infraction. This is in no way adequate. If the DPR is truly interested in change and meaningful regulations, the penalties for violators must have teeth. They are meant to force compliance and not just be a cost of doing business. My final concern is that of new research. It is imperative that the Department of Pesticide Regulation have a way to track, fast track, new research on potentially harmful pesticides and herbicides and incorporate it into new regulations. As of March 20, 2015, the World Health Organization reclassified glyphosate or Roundup as a probably carcinogenic to humans. However, according to the San Bernardino Ordinance, since Roundup currently has only a caution label, it would not even qualify for any enhanced regulations. This needs to change. I am truly hopeful that real change is at hand and that our kids will finally have someone in Sacramento who is actually looking out for their long-term health and safety. Thank you. My name is Juanita, and I was asked by a Grupo de Mujeres in Knight's Landing, uh, that's in Yolo County. Um, they, they were going to come, but uh, in the last uh, couple of years, we were um, uh, lucky to reopen a health uh, clinic, and uh, the women had to stay uh, because there was a meeting, uh, they're trying very hard to have the clinic be open in the evenings. Um, their children are not returned to their town and, uh, by the school buses from Woodland until about six. And so um, that becomes more urgent because of, uh, of what pesticides do around the area. Um, the children are now suffering, and they uh, uh, high uh, rates of asthma, respiratory illnesses, uh, cancer. Uh, to the parents, most of the community are farm workers, uh, but now to the children as well, and that includes uh, children from elementary to high school age. Um, so they stayed behind for that meeting. And they wrote the statement and wanted me to read it to you. Um, Night's Landing, Grupo de Mujeres. A while ago, a rural community in Night's Landing in Yolo County went through most, uh, a, a most tragic and, and saddest of situations. Our only elementary school was closed by the Woodland Unified School District which our elementary school uh, is under. The school district decided to bus our children to an elementary school in the outskirts of Woodland named Plainfield Elementary School. Most of the time when there were meetings between the school district and our community, which are mostly farm workers, the ones that went to the meetings were the, were the mothers. However, when the fathers found out that their children were going to be bused to Plainsfield Elementary School, they were so upset and worried that they started going to the meetings themselves uh, to, protect, uh, to protest and to attempt to stop the busing of their children to Plainsfield Elementary School. Most of our community was in agreement of not sending our children to Plainsfield and decided to ask organizations such as CRLA Foundation and the Knights Landing Family Resource Center, which help our community to provide some assistance applying for inter inter-district transfers. 
Uh, most families transferred our children uh, to Robbins Elementary School, a neighboring town five minutes away from Knight's Landing in Sutter County. Uh, because we went through this horrible experience, we would like to voice our concerns and let you become aware that pesticides do not belong near schools. It doesn't matter whether they are elementary, middle schools, or high schools. We know the dangers of pesticides and we do not want our children to get sick. Stop the pesticides around schools now. You can contact us at the number below and they give the, their telephone number. Um, and this is a partial list of the women that uh, wrote this statement. Um, Maida Vargas, Maria Ayala, Maria Naranjo, Guillermina Guillén, Jeneth Naranjo, and Josefina Quesada. That's from Yolo County. Um, I just wanted to say that there were uh, parents from the Bates Elementary School site in Cortland, uh, down in the Sacramento Delta, that were coming to this meeting. However, the door downstairs was locked, and I got an, uh, a text that they had to turn away. Luckily, two of them uh, still uh, were you know, caught and uh, asked to return, and they signed in, and uh, they're here. Uh, to give uh, their testimonial. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Rosalba Deas. Vengo representando a los padres de Bay. Y yo trabajo en NYCA. Es un child care para niños de padres inmigrantes que trabajan en el campo. Y el problema es que está pasando que allí Hay mucho las peras, las uvas y se aplican muchos pesticidas y todo eso y nunca nos avisan y los niños seguidos se nos enferman. Ahora últimamente hemos tenido mucho problema de los bebés y eso nos preocupa mucho que los niños se están enfermando y seguido vienen y nos avisan pues que los tenemos internados por problemas respiratorios y todo eso. Digo pues ese Tiene que ser el problema de los pesticidas porque nunca nos avisan, ¿verdad? Lo mismo en la escuela de BASE, tampoco está mucha, mucha pera y uva, como les digo, y, y todo eso está perjudicando al ambiente. Y eso es lo que queremos que notifiquen los rancheros cuándo se van a echar esos para que así no podamos exponer a los niños también uno afuera, estar adentro, ¿verdad? Hasta a uno mismo le perjudica porque también estamos teniendo ese problema que... Seguido hay problemas que las maestras andamos enfermas y es por lo mismo, ¿verdad? Y eso es lo que vengo a exponer de mi punto de vista de que queremos que se hable de eso, que se tome acción porque está pasando todo eso, con más con los niños tan chiquitos, tan pequeños. A mí me da un sentimiento de ver esas criaturas que ya empiezan con asma tan chiquitos y con esos problemas y por causa de los pesticidas, ¿verdad? Que están causando mucho problema. Yo sé que tienen que avisar los, los rancheros y pues a veces yo pienso, no sé, ellos no han tomado cartas en el asunto de ver qué es el problema, lo que está causando, ¿verdad? Pero ese es mi punto de vista que vengo a, a exponer y vengo representando a los padres de, de BASE y de mi comunidad donde trabajo allí, pues está casi pegado allí, cerca todo, y los padres dejan muy temprano a sus niños y vienen por ellos cuando termino de trabajar en, el, en, en los campos y, y eso es lo que quisiera exponer, mi punto de vista de que se hiciera algo de que, pues que se avisara, cuando menos se da, así uno poder hacer, qué puede hacer uno con los niños, de no sacarlos o, o decirles a los padres, pues este día no, no se va a trabajar con ellos, pero digo, también ellos, también ellos lo que, trabajan en el campo, están exponiéndose también ellos mucho, ¿verdad?, Pues muchas gracias. Rosalba, Rosalba. gracias. Hi, my name is uh, Rosalba and I work at the YMCA at a daycare that provides uh, services for um, parents who work in the fields. And the issue that we have is that 
Uh, we have a lot of uh, pear fields and grape fields around us, so a lot of pesticides are being applied, and we're never notified. So we have children getting sick left and right. Lately, we've had a lot of children getting sick, uh, and that is a source of concern for us. I mean, many times the parents tell us, you know, well, they're not coming because they've been admitted to the hospital because of uh, respiratory illnesses. Uh, I think the issue is because we're not even being notified about the pesticides. Same thing at our community school. Um, it is surrounded, again, by pears and, and by... Um, grape fields, and it's affecting our environment, and we want for the growers to actually provide notification, at least then we could take precautions, stay inside, tell the children to stay inside. It affects us as teachers too. Many teachers um, also miss uh, work because they're out sick for the same reason. So that's what I wanted to share with you, my point of view, that, you know, we need this discussed and we need action to be taken so that these notifications, notifications are enforced. And particularly when it's affecting such young children, I mean, it makes me enormously sad to see children that young already suffering from asthma and respiratory ailments due to uh, the application of these pesticides. And again, because uh, they're supposed to uh, provide notification, the ranchers are supposed to, and, and I don't know, maybe they just you know, don't realize uh, what they're causing in our children. So anyway, that's what I wanted to share with all of you, uh, representing all of uh, the parents from uh, my community and uh, the place where I work. Again, we're surrounded by fields. So um, uh, parents come and drop off their children very early at our daycare, and then they come pick them up very late in the evening um, after they're done working in the fields. And so I would like something to be done. Like I said, at least for them to actually uh, provide notifications so that we can uh, do something about it, keep the children inside or let the parents know, you know, uh, today we're not going to work with the children because, you know, it's too hazardous. But that affects them too because they work out there in the fields and they're also directly exposed. So thank you very much. ¿Dónde está ubicada el YMCA la escuela? Corvel. Portland. Thank you. Um, do we have any, one moment, you may come up. I'm just going to ask, do we have any questions? And if you wouldn't mind, just one moment, if we could change the slide, because we're, we are addressing some of these questions in the various comments. And I just want you to be aware of the other questions that DPR has that they would like to cover, um, so that you may want to include those in some of your comments today. So here we are, are you aware of any pesticide application restrictions that are uh, required that apply to your schools? If so, what are the restrictions? Are they adequate? Any issues or concerns? What should DPR consider when developing a regulation that may include restrictions on pesticide applications near schools, getting specific about time, for example, um, certain pesticides, application meth uh, methods, and should DPR set a distance? Is there any other input that you'd like to add? So I just wanted to put those up there so that you could consider them as you come forward and make your, your comments. Thank you for your patience. No Go worries. ahead. My name is Noemi. BS. I'm actually the daughter of Rosa, who just spoke in Clarksburg. We grew up in Clarksburg. She now works in Cortland, which is less than 10 miles away. It's all within the River Delta. Um, growing up there, we were very exposed to pesticides just because it's an agricultural farming community, and it's a way of life, right, for the Delta. Um, it became part of the culture. You go outside, you play. Kids are, you know, they don't think about pesticides. You're out there and then you hear the sprayer come in and you're not aware, you're not educated on what those hazards are until sometimes it's too late. So I recently returned back from five years living in the Bay Area. And now that I'm back, I see that my asthma is flaring up again. And so to me, what I would want to educate that we take a stance on and we change is education. Education on an early level where my mom works, you know, these are kids, babies, 
babies till they're ready to go to pre-K. And so abdication for that level, for the teachers to know what to do when the fields are being sprayed, for the children to close the windows, to take precaution, education needs to be key here. Not only in the YMCA where my mother works, but also in the elementary that's just down the street. And then the high school that's just over the bridge. And then the district office that's just another couple miles down the street in uh, Rio Vista. So all this, um, you know, I came here to give testimony on where I grew up and really the effects that I see on folks having asthma, having upper respiratory issues, um, not only at an early age, but a late stage in life. I see my father now fighting asthma. He's been a farm worker nearly all his life. Right, And so I think that the key point here is early education, getting information early on. In Delta alone, which is, resides in Clarksburg, California, there are over 207 pesticides used that I'm aware of that are used within and near the school. 207 pesticides, of which are known to cause cancer, respiratory issues, and other health problems. And so again, you know, we need to think of not only the community, but the children that are going, growing up culturally unaware that this is happening to their bodies, but also culturally inclined because they want to go and enjoy a nice day out in the Delta to be outside, but yet you're being exposed. So people need to be educated on that. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm just, bear with me, I'm going to change this because it seems to be petering out. And if there are any other questions, please come up. Test. Okay. Here we go, fresh battery. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Hillary, and I'm visiting with my son from Sonoma County. Um, I looked up in the California Food and Agricultural Code, um, a number 6614 in the California Food and Agricultural Code. It's a section that says, if there is a reasonable possibility of contamination of the bodies, clothing of persons not involved in the application process, or if there is a reasonable possibility of damage to non-target crops or animals or other public or private property, that the pesticide application would not be done. And so I, what I'm, my question is, how do we determine the reasonable possibility? Because it seems like there's a lot of drift that happens that we're ignoring. So I would, be, I would like to see a stricter determination or a stricter language within this particular section that makes it more um, obvious what the drift potential is and what the exposure is to the people who are exposed. Thank you. Hi, my name is Robin Christofek. I'm a public health nurse. And I got interested in this subject uh, when I lived in a little town in Texas, Wolforth, Texas, right outside of Lubbock. And I lived a block away from cotton fields. And it's the only time in my life I ever had asthma. I mean, I've been totally fine before and after. It was, seemed pretty clear. It was after the spring. And also, I worked in OBGYN, and there was clearly a high rate of uh, birth defects in the farm workers that came to deliver, uh, you know, the women who delivered the babies. And that perked my interest. Um, so what I want to talk about is I kind of want to back up as a nurse um, go back to the basics and, and just kind of get real here because pesticides, the purpose of pesticides is to kill, right? We need to face that. The purpose of pesticides is to kill target populations, but we are not that different than the target populations. The pesticides kill in many different ways, but, uh, you know, cell, uh, cell wall disruption, endocrine disruption, neurological disruption. That's why in Parkinson's, a lot of neurological problems in humans are related to pesticide use. Um, so we just, we need to face that there's this physiology that happens. And it's not, I mean, it's great that you're talking about schools and, and you know, children are vulnerable. But really, I think we need to look even bigger and talk about complete pesticide abolishing because pesticides are hurting 
hurting all of us, you know, not just the children. Um, I used to, I grew up here and I used to swim in the river as a child. It was a wonderful summer thing to do. I wouldn't let my grandchildren swim in the river anymore. There's been many studies. I have one right here. The EPA um, did a study on feather and Sacramento rivers. Uh, 15 pesticides are found regularly in the rivers just from coming off downstream. The United States Geological Service um, did a study on the Delta. I know there are people here talking about the Delta. 37 pesticides um, just in one sample of water they did there. Um, you know, there's that famous guy who used to swim from Shasta down to Sacramento, and, you know, he had horrible skin lesions uh, just from swimming in the Sacramento River. There's a, there's a myth floating also around about glyphosate. A lot of people say, oh, it, you know, it, it degrades after six hours. Well, glyphosate is also absorbed into the plant as it's growing. So when we ingest those foods, we are ingesting glyphosate. And there's um, a recent study, 18 countries, people were, um, they're given their, they gave urine samples in all of the countries, people um, had high rates of glyphosate in their urine. Um, it's also, as several people have, have mentioned, it's, it's definitely known to, um, you know, promote cancer, especially breast cancer. So I guess one thing that I would just like to say is, would you all really want your children to be in a school surrounded by fields? Or would you like to live in one of those neighborhoods where they're spraying right next door? And it's, I think, you know, people are talking about a one-mile uh, buffer zone. But really, I think we have to talk about completely abolishing pesticides. Thank you. Thank you. And um, so I, how many more comments do we have? I just wanted to, to get a, a cue going here. Anyone else? Okay. So it looks like we have six more comments, just for us all to be aware of that. If we need to go past seven, we will, because we started a little bit late, but I just wanted to get a sense. Come on up. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Dr. Harry Wong, and uh, I'm um, the Vice President of Physicians for Social Responsibility here in Sacramento. We have 700 members, and we have 30,000 members nationally in PSR. So I want to thank DPR for holding this uh, workshop and for giving us an opportunity and everyone in the audience to come tonight. So as a physician, I treat many children who have neural development disorders, including autism, kids with learning disorders, and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And that's why I'm very, I'm here tonight, I'm very concerned about the growing numbers of children with those disorders and the relationship with uh, pesticide exposure, in which there's more and more science uh, coming out about. And so that would be one of the things I would urge um, a DPR to do is to, as someone commented earlier, make sure you have the most recent science about exposure to pesticides, especially for children. And as you define what is a school, if you're looking at preschool children, age really matters. And uh, uh, we know that, as, as mentioned, uh, we're talking about neurotoxins. Um, so if, if you're going down to Head Start age or preschool age, then you really want to protect the most vulnerable. One of the uh, shocking things for me looking through the report from last year was the wide disparity in geography and the amount of exposure that ranged from, I believe, in Tulare County, something like 63% of schools had uh, pesticides sprayed within a quarter mile to uh, Sacramento County, which I think was around 8%. So one of the things we look for in government and agencies is to have a level playing field. And that's one of the things that you can do to protect all of us. And we are a community, uh, whether we're in Sacramento or in Tulare uh, County, we, we want there to be minimal risks for kids in all areas. And that would go a long ways towards eliminating and trying to reduce the disparities that have to do with ethnicity, which um, should not be something children have to worry about, what their ethnicity is or what county they work in or where their school happens to be located. We'd like whatever uh, action plan you take to protect the most vulnerable and be consistently applied. Whatever you need to do to consistently apply it all across every county, every school in, in the state of California. Um, and then as far as looking at the science, um, besides having access to the latest science, to also look at the science of 
what we know about how exposures for not only, as I mentioned, young children, but multiple agents, how that impacts uh, children's uh, brain development, and also the impact of environment and individual genetic vulnerability, which could combine to increase risk for certain um, cancers or neurodevelopment disorders. And for example, the Mind Institute here at UC Davis is doing a lot of research on how environment impacts of uh, children's development and that we know there's an interaction between the environment and the genetic makeup of that child. We want there to be safety for the most vulnerable uh, of our children uh, and I hope that you look at the science. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. Hi, my name is Renee Sankis. I'm just here as a parent to a child who has autism. Um, he's six years old. And um, the doctor that just spoke alluded to the Mind Institute, which, if you haven't heard of it, is, is absolutely wonderful. But they did a study, I think the, the results came out last summer, that women, pregnant women, who lived near agriculture had a higher chance of giving birth to a child on, this, on the spectrum with autism. So I'm, I guess I'm talking about, I know we were talking about school age kids and that's really important and I understand asthma rates and cancer, but I, I want people to think about when the child is developing, developing in utero. Um, at the time that I was pregnant with him, I was living in, in North Stockton in a new development and literally across the street was ag. And I grew up in Stockton, so I'm totally used to seeing the dust croppers and all of that. And I have family members who are cherry and walnut farmers, so I've grown up with it. But um, I just want, what I want to get out today is just to think about how pesticide use is affecting us even in utero. Um, and hopefully the Mind Institute will continue to study and find out more about it, but it's it's... I don't know if the word is exciting, but that was those were exciting results for me when I when I heard about um, that study, and um, that's about all I have. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you, Renee. Yes, I think we had a handful of others. Please come forward, Andrew. Thank you. Um, my name is Andrew Becker, and I'm a district representative for Assembly Member Kevin McCarty. Uh, on behalf of Assemblymember McCarty, um, I'd like to you know, welcome everyone to Sacramento who's not from here. Um, and thank everybody for participating in this important, important workshop. Um, I'd also like to thank the uh, um, California Sacramento State Center for Collaborative Policy for facilitating you know, the discussion. Um, and uh, the Assemblymember really looks forward to seeing where the discussion goes and what kind of recommendations are going to be made. Uh, to ensure the safety of all school children in California. Uh, as chair of the budget subcommittee, uh, budget subcommittee for Education Finance and a member of the Environmental Safety and Toxic Safety Committee, uh, this issue is really at the heart of the Assembly member's legislative priorities. Uh, he has supported and sponsored bills in the past uh, which both protect um, environment and support learning. Uh, this effort hits so you know, basically uh, on both of those topics, supporting learning by protecting the environment that children are going to be learning in. Uh, and perhaps more importantly, as a father of two young girls, he shares um, the concerns uh, regarding the need for school children to be able to learn and grow up in a completely safe environment. Um, I think anybody with kids can agree with that, at, at least. Um, this includes being protected against harmful agricultural pesticides and, you know, the fact that kids could be unwittingly um, being poisoned while learning their multiplication tables or playing Foursquare or Hopscotch, you know, that's, that's unacceptable to any parent. So uh, the reality is that many of the students uh, at risk from ag agricultural pesticides um, do live in disadvantaged communities, and they already face an uphill battle at times. So uh, this is why the work today that's being done and in future workshops uh, is so important. Uh, on behalf of the assembly member and myself, um, I'd like to welcome everyone again to Sacramento and thank everyone for being a, import, a part of this important discussion. We really um, thank all the hard work that's being done and put, that has been put into this and facilitating this.
Uh, we look forward to seeing the fruits of the labor and the positive change, hopefully, that will make for California, California school children, and uh, the next generation of uh, Californians. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, please come forward, David. Good evening. Uh, my name is David Fippen, and uh, I reside in Ripon, California. And uh, I may not be too popular here tonight. It's been humbling to hear your concerns. I am an almond grower, and uh, I'm a, a commercial applicator. And we also hold, uh, within our employee, we employ about 10 people on the agricultural side of our operation. And we also process almonds, employ about another 40 in that operation. Uh, I've grown up on a farm. Uh, we actually have a family farm. There's five families that farm together in partnership. I guess what I want to speak about mostly, and, and I, it's, again, humbling to hear your concerns, uh, our operation farms voluntarily 80 acres for the Ripon Unified School District and another 20 acres for the city of Ripon, both located adjacent to Ripon's newest and finest school, uh, where my grandchildren attend school. So certainly, uh, I want to uh, imp impact on all of you that uh, we're pretty concerned as farmers, we're very concerned about our children and our welfare and the children in the public schools. Um, I just want to relate to you a few of the practices that we use in particular. Uh, we never spray uh, adjacent to the public school when it's occupied. Almost without fail, we always start our spray operations adjacent to the school about midnight, sometimes 11 o'clock and usually finish before 2 or 3 a.m. Uh, we never spray with a wind exceedance of, of five miles per hour. And that's uh, the precautions that we take to make sure that we're not impacting schools. I heard a gentleman mention that maybe we ought to spray on Friday night rather than uh, so that there'd be three days before school starts. And you know what? It wouldn't be impossible for us to comply with something like that. I've heard a lot of comments about notifying the school district of what we're going to spray and when. and. Uh, Obviously, everybody has opinions and thoughts, but I'm wondering how impactful that would be if I, I certainly could let the school district know that uh, Friday night we're going to go out at midnight and spray. I'm not sure how valuable that information would be to anybody. Um, we don't have drift onto the school district. And I heard somebody talk about a monitoring device. There actually is a monitoring device at this school, uh, again, across the street from the, from the almond orchard that we apply farm protective chemicals to. Uh, that's pretty much our experience and what I wanted to relay to uh, those that, that are concerned with uh, pesticide safety in schools. It's been the uh, practice in the Ripon Unified School District for over 25 years to purchase property in the agricultural zone just outside of the city limits. They can pr purchase property and build schools for less expense by doing that. It's been my company's practice to utilize those fields uh, for the benefit of the school district uh, so that the school district can use those funds for agriculture education. It's basically a handshake between our company and the school district. So we generate a great deal of funds for the school district by doing that and utilizing that property. So maybe a different thought than some of you had, and uh, appreciate DPRs uh, allowing us to speak uh, to these issues. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, I believe I had a queue. It's, yes, Anne and Paul, and now Jessica. And are there any any other? Okay, and Richard, anyone else? And then I'd, I'd like to actually close down the session because of the time after. So we have our queue. Everyone knows where you are? Okay. And Richard, you'll be our final comment. Okay. Um, good evening. I'm Ann Catton from California Rural Legal Assistance Foundation, and I appreciate all the effort that went into to, um, to putting this on and, and the whole series and the translation and everything. Um, and I join with others in urging um, the department to require substantial protection zones around schools and comprehensive notification of the schools, teachers, and parents, and we can provide more details later. Um, and the report of on pesticide use near schools released by DPH last year showed that Latino school children were twice as likely to attend schools near heaviest agricultural pesticide use. And this is an environmental justice and disparity that the department needs to correct with further restrictions. Um, we also think that there should be work to have a cap around schools in total pesticide use to address the cumulative exposure issues that many people have expressed concern about tonight. 
Um, and then I um, and I appreciate the comments of the um, farmer from Ripon, and I appreciate his efforts. Um, I also think that uh, protection zones are an opportunity um, zone for trying alternatives to pesticides and lower toxicity pesticides. And you know, I hope that the Ripon School District and other areas like that are, are are utilizing that. And then I wanted to use the remainder of my time just to address a couple of. Concerns. I, I appreciate the concept paper that was put out, but there are a, a few a few things in it that I just want to provide a, a different anyway my my take on. Um, I really don't think that DPR should be claiming that comprehensive evaluation indicates low risk to most schools both because monitoring has been really quite limited and the department has a substantial backlog of unfinished risk assessments. Of the three air monitoring sites currently at schools, um, only selected fumigants are being monitored at two, the Oxnard and the Watsonville site. The third site at Shafter High School um, is being monitored for more pesticides, but it is an appreciable distance from fields. Um, I checked and there was no reported pesticide use in the same one square mile section as that school in the last three years. Um, though clearly, you know, outside of that area there is high pesticide use, but immediately adjacent there isn't. Um, and we've heard tonight from many people who have kids going to schools that are adjacent to fields. and. Um, my point being that um, it, that school does not represent by any means the heaviest exposure to pesticides, and so it shouldn't be represented as such. Um, also, in, in the concept paper, I appreciate the effort made to um, survey ag commissioners, and I think it gained valuable information, but we have to keep in mind that there is a low rate of pesticide illness reporting, that many of the effects we're concerned about are not acute, so wouldn't be evident from a complaint, um, and that there are issues with um, limited bilingual and no bilingual staff in some ag commissioners offices that are also an impediment to reporting of, of illnesses and, and to um, reporting of, of complaints that something that just needs to be improved on. Um, you know, and I appreciate that DPR is looking to the San Bernardino ordinance as a model and it does have strengths in that it applies to both restricted and unrestricted pesticides and prohibits aerial applications within a quarter mile of schools. Um, I think there are other ways it can be improved upon. Um, quarter mile I don't think is quite large enough. Um, one, at least one county already has a half mile um, buffer for uh, aerial application. And also um, I think that the, uh, for other applications, um, other types of application, the um, applications are only um, prohibited an hour before and two hours after school, and um, there needs to be um, provision because there's stuff going on, on on campuses all the time, and there um, needs to be time to allow for off gassing. Um, so, really, you know, at least the most toxic pesticides, the buffer zone should be in place all the time, and. Um, Anyway, and just in closing, um, again, buffer zones and notification and use caps are a great place to start, but we really need to uh, work to um, phase out fumigants and reduce use of other highly toxic pesticides. Thank you. Great. Um, I know it's getting late, so I'll try to be brief. Um, so my name is Paul Towers. I represent Pesticide Action Network North America. We work on behalf of small and mid-scale farmers, indigenous communities, rural communities. Um, and really, uh, you know, I sort of think it's funny to have um, the grower and public hearings or spaces as very um, separate from each other, in part because we represent both sets of those constituencies. And I think um, from, from our perspective, this is actually a really unique opportunity as we begin to look at schools. And I wanna really thank Chris and, you know, and, and George and, you know, and Randy and everyone um, for creating this, this space to have this conversation. Um, I think right now the, the opportunity is really to think about how do we support and encourage uh, innovative agriculture around our schools. 
Um, rather, I'd sort of flip this conversation on its head um, so that we're not diving into the details so much about, you know, when do we notify, how much do we notify? Those are important concepts, should we need to get there? Um, but I think the reality is we have an opportunity in California, and I, I heard Secretary Ross speak to this just the other day, to think about how we um, create truly innovative, organic, and sustainable agriculture around our schools, to show that as models, um, to bring that into, um, to sort of, uh, you know, recognize that that's the type of agriculture that um, performs best and models what we should be doing around our most vulnerable sites. So I'd encourage us to think about that as the opportunity first. How can DPR collaborate with CDFA um, to create that type of agriculture and space, work with the University of California Cooperative Extension, um, work with uh, UCIPM and all the you know, sort of litany of other partners that it takes, I think, to really lift up that type of agriculture. I think that's the, the opportunity before us. Um, as we, as we sort of move down that path and that opportunity to create truly innovative agricultural zones around schools, I think we can think about what do we need to restrict. Um, I, it wasn't really mentioned in the, the early part of the presentation, but I think you know, the impetus for this is that we recognize that hazardous pesticides are used in close proximity to California schools. Right? Over 30 schools in, here in Sacramento County, for 18 schools in Yolo, neighboring Yolo County, hazardous pesticides that are linked to cancer, to developmental effects that are linked to a whole host of impacts on our children's development that need to be dealt with and can't be sufficiently on a piecemeal pesticide by pesticide basis. Right? I mean, I work with some of the folks in this room on, on the issue of chlorpyrifos. It's been under evaluation since 2004 here at DPR. You know, we, it takes forever to regulate or to evaluate the impact of one pesticide. And we often don't know about the impacts of that pesticide for years, if not decades after the fact. And already it's too late. We've impacted our children's health. We've impacted their intelligence. We see the impacts to falling IQs and other developmental delays. That doesn't work. That's not okay. So we need to take steps to look comprehensively at restricting pesticide use near California schools. And so, you know, we heard Don, the, some of the physicians speak earlier to the impacts of multiple pesticides interaction. We've heard about the delays. Um, that doesn't work. We also know that pesticides are drifting. We saw the evidence of that earlier this week. Three of the air monitor sites were near schools. That's evidence that pesticides are drifting. They're landing they're near our schools. We know that doesn't equate to exposure. Don't call me out for that. But we do know that that, that is, in fact, pesticides are landing on our schools. The drift is happening at air monitors on school sites, just three of them of the six that are monitored in the entire state. So drift is happening. It's a problem. And we know that increasingly the science work out of UC Berkeley, out of UC Davis, are preeminent in academic institutions. The science is there linking very minute amounts to impacts on children's health and intelligence. That's unacceptable. It's unacceptable to allow continued use, even in very small amounts, near our schools. And we know because of the way that these pesticides are applied, I know some applicators are here in the room, that because of uh, methods like uh, aerial application or fumigation, these really 1950s outdated methods of application with these gaseous pesticides, we know that those have a high tendency to drift. When we sample for them, we find them. They're landing near our children, and that's, again, unacceptable. We know that voluntary systems don't work, and we know that we need a mandatory sort of minimum comprehensive basis for these regulations. As you look at that litany of the hodgepodge of regulations at county by county level, they're, they're both insufficient and all over the place. We need a minimum of protection around our schools. And so I think you know, we can get into the sort of notic notification and how to improve notification. I think that's an important conversation to have, but the reality is the conversation needs to start with how do we make the right kind of agriculture, modern, sustainable, organic agriculture take place near our schools, and then we can get into the conversation about how do we improve maybe outside of those ag innovation zones, outside of those no spray buffer zones, about how do we better notify through robocalls, through you know, emails through letters to parents, all those right types of ways to better notify. But that's, that's the end of the conversation. Let's start with what needs to happen first, and we can end up there. So I, I again, thank DPR staff. I know it's getting late. Um, I know you've got many workshops ahead of you. Um, and I just want to thank you for taking the time. I know this isn't easy. Um, and thank you for listening to my comments. So again, I, I know I have a lot more written comments you'll be happy to see down the road, but, but I'll try and keep this brief for the moment. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. So Jessica and then Richard. Yes? 
inviting us to come. It is an opportunity. I'm a retired teacher, a science teacher, and grew up in uh, Lincoln, uh, where my property was crop dusted by the nearby nursery, which can use unregistered pesticides. So it's a subject dear to my heart. And uh, I'm um, representing moms across moms across America, and we are set to ban glyphosate, and that's our mission. And unfortunately, industrial ag has come to realize the problem with the resistant super, you know, super weeds, and they've come in with 2,4-D. So it's just bigger and stronger pesticides. So as Paul's saying, if we can use this as an opportunity to look for integrated pest management, and this might want to be concerned. I don't know if there's anything we can do here about the California Department of Food and Ag 79. Uh, chemicals that they okayed on, that was their Christmas present to us on December 24th um, to give that for this coming year. Uh, if we could include in some, of, they didn't include integrated pest management in any of those. What is, the, what, how can the EPA, uh, you know, where, do you have any jurisdiction over what the CDFA is telling the state they, to do, to go ahead and spray those like they're doing here in Sacramento? and all over the state. So what I'd like to suggest here is you have six pesticides you're monitoring near schools. I'd like you to invite you to make glyphosate one of those. Um, that's one that has been avoided all across the United States. We had 10,000 parents call in one week to the EPA, National EPA last year, asking to have glyphosate testing. That's the most prevalent pesticide used, and they're not... Um, they're not testing for it. And I personally tested Carmichael and Oak Grove water. We have 0.15 parts per billion in our drinking water. We're drinking that. We're watering our organic gardens with Roundup, weed killer. And so being at the confluence of the two rivers, we're draining all those chemicals right here past our city. And in our, it goes into our drinking water. And that continues to add and add. We found it in three out of 10 breast milk um, breast, uh, samples from nursing moms. We did it because the EPA is not doing it. So I'm inviting for monitoring around schools to have glyphosate be, because it is so prevalent. And there's been resistance from big ag for even acknowledging that it's in, uh, in our water and in our soil and so on. <clears throat> we know that the American Academy of Pediatrics asks us to reduce uh, poisons uh, exposure to our children. And I know in my grandparents' day, they didn't use any pesticides. It was all organic. So this isn't necessary. And um, around our schools, I think it's a tremendous idea coming out tonight to make this be a buffer zone and showcase for organics, yeah, integrated pest management, and using diversified plants and cover cropping and vigorous soil with lots of probiotics, rota rotations and mulching. They're all good things that could replace the chemicals that are easy, quick, but long-term for our grandchildren. And what will you drink? What will you eat 20 years from now when it's accumulated in your body, in your water, in your air? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And our final comments, Richard? And then Chris will wrap up for us. Hello again. Um, I'm wondering about the number of times a farmer would need to notify the school per season or per month. I understood for the Japanese beetle, I think there's a 10 notifications between like now and August. So it's like every other week you get notified, oh, we're spraying again, we're spraying again next Friday. It's almost like they'd be called crying wolf that the parent gets saying, oh, okay. I, I, I don't know if anything can be done about that, if, where it gets to be just rep repetitive time and again, and soon they start ignoring it. Um, an issue to consider. Uh, another thing is uh, some children are more sensitive than others. And some fumigants, yeah, there's high, high risk, and others like, yeah, low risk. Do we really need to notify them? Because we're, but even if you're, I don't know. It's, it's another open question is if we're spraying like just plain water or sugar solution, is that going to cause a problem for some students if it drifts over? because they're so sensitive to dust. So I'm not sure where to draw the line, whether it's a pesticide, high risk, or low risk pesticide. So I'm, it's just a concern. I'm not sure what the answer is. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Richard, and thank, thank you to all of you for, for staying here late and for your comments. I'll invite Chris to make his final remarks. Hey, I, just, I just wanted to thank you once again for all your comments this evening. Uh, it's very important, as we mentioned to you, this is sort of our listening tour for us, so we want to get as much information as we can. I just want to note, too, as I, I told you I'd uh, mention this again, key dates on here. We really want your comments by July 31st. Uh, to, that's sort of important to us in terms of formulating um, our, our package to be done by the end of the year. Um, so uh, any questions? Um, uh, I think also on there. That, uh, George, George is our point here. And, and please refer your comments to George Farnsworth. And, um, and we appreciate again all your, all your comments this evening. Thank you very much. If you should have any written comments, please bring them to me. And we'll make sure that they're incorporated into the, the meeting summary. Thank you again, and have a, a lovely evening.